It's another nice day here in Southern California and it made me want to spend some time here with Mother Nature. A mother goddess is a personification of motherhood and is usually equated with the earth or the natural world, sometimes referred to as Mother Earth or as the Earth Mother. The concept is complementary to a sky father or father sky, which I touched on in my last video and will leave a link in the description in case you missed it. In Theosophy, the Earth Goddess is called the Planetary Logos of Earth. She is sometimes identified with the Triple Goddess, who takes the form of Maiden, Mother, and Crone archetypes. She is described as Mother Earth, Mother Nature, associated with the Full Moon and Venus, the Earth, and the Sea. Sometimes called Gaia, Carl Jung suggested that the archetypal mother was a part of the collective unconscious of all humans and a doorway to the unseen. The upper Paleolithic Venus figurines have been sometimes explained as depictions of an earth goddess and in Norse mythology Frigg or Freya is described as the wife of the god Odin and where we get the name for Friday from. Friday is also a day of congregational prayer in Islam, which is performed just after noon, replacing the second of the usual five daily obligatory prayers. The Islamic prophet Muhammad is quoted as saying, The best day the sun rises over is Friday. On it, Allah created Adam. On it, he was made to enter paradise. On it, he was expelled from it. And the last hour will take place on no other day than Friday. For Shiites, historically, their clergy discouraged Shiites from attending Friday prayers. According to them, communal Friday prayers with a sermon were wrong and were not to be performed until the return of their 12th Imam. However, some modernist Imams demanded that Shiites should observe these Friday prayers in an effort to bridge the gap with Sunnis and eventually became standard by Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. Khomeini is the founder of the modern Islamic Republic of Iran and leader of the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which was instigated by the CIA and saw the overthrow of the last Shah of Iran and the end of the 2500-year-old Persian monarchy. While many Iranians will claim that the Shah of Iran was a puppet of Western intelligence agencies, and the revolution was meant to liberate Iran from this covert external influence, I would argue that the deep state entity has infiltrated and influenced all sides. And while they like to bribe, blackmail, and pay off politicians, they prefer totalitarian dictatorships, whether theocratic, which means ruled by religious figures, or communist regimes where the state owns all property and there's no individual freedoms or rights. The primary difference between Shiite Muslims and Sunni Muslims stems from a split that happened almost 1400 years ago, after Muhammad, the founder of Islam, died in the year 632, and a great dispute arose over who would claim his position as the leader of the new religion. The successor to Muhammad would have powerful influence over society government, and trade. Some people thought that anyone with qualifications could take over, and they became known as Sunni Muslims. They insisted Muhammad's father-in-law and friend Abu Bakr should take over. Others believed that only someone from Muhammad's family would be the rightful leader. This camp favored Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali, and they became known as Shiite Muslims. In the end, the majority Sunni sect got their way and Abu Bakr became the first official successor, or Caliph, to the Prophet Muhammad. Even so, the Shiites did not recognize him as legitimate and held fast to their conviction about their allegiance to Muhammad's descendants, whom they called the family of the house. Genetically speaking, this original family was composed of redheads and blondes. The Prophet Muhammad himself was a redhead in his youth and after the age of 40 started dyeing his graying beard with red henna 
to gain a more youthful appearance. Author Henrik von Schweren has stated that, quote, Red hair is still honored amongst the Muslims as the Prophet Muhammad himself was reported to have red hair. And this appears true as many people converted to the Islamic faith also dyed their hair with red henna in imitation and respect to their Prophet, even though, in most cases, it is obviously not their natural hair color. This image is said to be of an actual red hair from the beard of the Prophet Muhammad, said to have been shaved from Muhammad's face by his barber, Salman, in the presence of Abu Bakr, Ali, and several others. The beard is kept protected in a glass container in the Istanbul Museum in Turkey, with individual red hairs distributed to other mosques and museums around the world. During her lifetime, Aisha, the Prophet's beloved wife, gained the epithet Humaira, a word which has been translated as light or fair, but whose meaning can most accurately be rendered as blonde. Subsequently, she has become known to the Islamic people as Aisha the Blonde. That said, Ali, a first cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, was also renowned for his blonde hair, as were his descendants who founded the Shiite branch of Islam. There appears to have been a blonde, racially Nordic element amongst the leadership of the Arabic people from the very earliest time. Thus, the distinguished Harvard anthropologist Carlton S. Kuhn has noted when referring to the population of the Yemen plateau, quote, the Nordic looking people are usually confined to the social stratum from which civil officers and religious men are drawn, and it is more than a coincidence that the acknowledged descendants of the Prophet are lighter skinned and show greater evidence of blondism than the rest of the population. There may perhaps have been a Nordic strain associated with the Holy Families. Professor C.S. Kuhn has also stated that amongst the people of Morocco, quote, the ordinary city Arabs are little different from their pastoral and agricultural breathing, but this rule does not apply to the aristocratic families. These merchant princes are sometimes blonde and of Nordic appearance. Others of them look like Meccan aristocrats in Arabia. Of course, the original Berber tribes were the fair-skinned, blonde, and ginger Moors. I'm talking about the actual tribes and not their slaves. Despite what modern Afrocentric, UN, and globalist-funded propaganda says, and the original Berbers around Mount Atlas, especially before Islam, share genetic affinities with the tall Caucasian mummies of the natives of the Canary Islands off the coast of West Africa as well as to the Basque people of the Pyrenees between France and Spain. They call themselves Amazigh, which means free people and synonymous with the fabled Amazons of mythology. The name Berber stems from Barbar, meaning bearded in Latin, and a term also used to describe bearded Germanic tribes, the Barbarians. Berber, or Amazigh society, was essentially matriarchal, and they managed to still hold their women in high esteem, despite being converted to Islam. Which brings us back to the goddess Freya, or Alat, a pre-Islamic Arabian goddess worshipped under various associations through the entire peninsula, including Mecca, and to whom a stone cube near Mecca was held sacred as part of her cult. The goddesses Al-Uzza, Alat, and Menet formed a triad in pre-Islamic Arabia and were very popular goddesses in Mecca at the time of Muhammad. Sometimes the three were referred to as the daughters of Allah, and one of them had the title of goddess of the morning and evening star, Venus, having much in common with Ishtar and Astarte. Allah is mentioned by Herodotus as Alilat, whom he identifies with Aphrodite. She is sometimes also equated with Athena, and is called the mother of the gods, or greatest of all, she is the goddess of springtime and fertility, the earth goddess who brings prosperity. The Kaaba, or the big Muslim cube, is a building at the center of Islam's most important mosque, the Great Mosque of Mecca. The Black Stone of Mecca, or Kaaba Stone, is a Muslim relic, which according to some Islamic tradition dates back to the time of Adam and Eve, and that the stone was found by Abraham and his son Ishmael. This is the eastern cornerstone of the Kaaba, 
the ancient sacred stone building towards which Muslims pray in the center of the Grand Mosque in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. The stone is a dark rock polished smooth by the hands of millions of pilgrims that has been broken into a number of fragments cemented into a silver frame in the side of the Kaaba. Often described as a meteorite, many Muslim pilgrims try to kiss it as they circle the Kaaba as part of their yearly ritual of Hajj, or holy pilgrimage, trying to emulate the kiss that it received from the Prophet Muhammad, or at least touch it as it's supposed to count in their favor on Judgment Day. Some Muslims believe that the stone itself has some supernatural powers and that it fell from the sky during the time of Adam and Eve with the power to cleanse worshippers of their sins by absorbing them into itself. While I personally can't verify if the stone is a meteorite, most anthropologists are aware of the history of stone and especially meteorite worship in pre-Islamic Arabia. That said, the original temple at Mecca contained 360 idols used for ritual worship before the Prophet Muhammad was born with astro-theological significance. In fact, the Kaaba is accurately aligned to the cycles of the moon, which speaks to its pagan origins. Pagan implies polytheism, meaning more than one god, and in ancient times, celestial objects such as the moon were venerated as gods or goddesses. The Kaaba is also aligned to the sun at midsummer, as well as to Canopus, a bright star named after a navigator for a king of Sparta. The cube represents Earth in the Pythagorean, Hindu, Egyptian, and Platonic traditions. It's even realized as a sacred symbol today by the Freemasons. The earliest reference we have to a mother goddess worshipped as a cube-shaped stone is from the Neolithic Anatolia. The ideograms for Kubaba in the Hittite alphabet are a cube, a double-headed axe, a dove, a vase, and a gate, all images of the goddess in Neolithic Europe. Kubaba means hollow vessel or cave, which would still be a supreme image of the goddess. Deities of other cultures known to have been associated with black stones include Aphrodite at Paphos, Cybele in Rome, Astarte in Byblos, and the famous Artemis or Diana of Ephesus, whose most ancient sculpture was, and is said, carved from a black meteorite. These stone statues were brought out during annual processions where ecstatic rites of her worship were conducted in the streets of the city which involved dancing for extended periods, something that can still be seen in certain Islamic Sufi sects, which dance and enter into trance states. For humans, the most exalted state of love is called ecstasy, union with the beloved. And this ritual, called Sama, exists to create the state of divine ecstasy for the dervish. The combination of the sound and the movements is enough to create this state, and the technique has been used in Egypt since the most ancient times. This is not dance as we know it. It's a Sufi ritual for achieving that divine union and to be in ecstasy for as long as the music lasts. In this divine state, earthly cares are annihilated while the winged spirit soars like pure white egrets before a blazing fire. Almost a thousand years ago, the Sufi Sheikh Abu Madian wrote, it is the method of the saints and the pious. Sound is the key factor Hypnotic, trance-inducing rhythms invoke the ritual movements, while the sheikh's words guide the dervish's inner heart through ecstatic dimensions of consciousness. Sometimes called hadra, the state of divine presence, such gatherings form part of sama, which is the ritualistic use of sound 
for an ecstatic session. Abu Madian explains. The folk of Sama are a group of people who completely renounce the material world and devote their hearts to their beloved, irrevocably divorcing the material world. When they hear a teaching, the lights of love are kindled in their hearts, which clothes their external bodies with the onset of ecstasy. In their ecstasy, they occupy the station of the possessed. They become agitated and lose their senses, but they bear no blame. In this way, ecstatic sessions are permissible for them, and their ecstasy becomes a right and an act of truthfulness, a spiritual method and a reality. The slower early movements resemble a pulsating heart in its ribcage. And the whole ensemble becomes a single living body through the union of the breath and the heartbeat, which are regulated by the percussion and a repetition of the divine name Hai, the living one. Then as the music quickens, the sacred blood flows freely throughout the entire body. Ecstatic sessions like this are open to everyone. They usually last for two hours, often with two more after a tea break. Of course, at a Muled or Saints festival, celebrations go on throughout the night. Abu Madian said, ecstasy is like lightning. It flashes and disappears. Although the state of ecstasy is not permanent, the desire to be one with the beloved is always there. So these sessions exist as a bridge to easily cross over. In ecstasy, time and place cease to exist, and a true sense of liberation from earthly laws allows the spirit complete freedom to fuse with the beloved and become one. Zikr is a means to discover truth within oneself, and in the words of the great Sheikh Ibn Arabi, the truth is found in ecstasy.
some cults, the dancing oftentimes involves certain substances, which I won't name, but are said to aid in the dissolution or death of the ego, to allow the individual to commune with the subconscious or collective unconscious mind, which is another way of saying the goddess. This included activities which anthropologists often label as fertility rites, which means that they became intimate with each other for long, controlled periods of time, stimulating their central nervous systems by engaging in activities that they believe aided in achieving altered states of consciousness, which allegedly transcends the material universe and makes higher knowledge or wisdom available. This is why the goddess is historically associated with wisdom, as it is a reference to this divine access to knowledge, or gnosis, that one cannot get from books, but comes from elsewhere. It was Nikola Tesla, the famous inventor who practiced occult techniques of internal transmutation of energy, that once said, quote, My brain is only a receiver. In the universe, there is a core from which we obtain knowledge strength and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know that it exists. The home of the goddess Aphrodite was at Paphos on Cyprus, and various classical writers describe the occult rituals which went on there in her honor, in which a tapered black stone, the object of veneration at her temple, was used. While in previous videos I have stated that the astro-theological use of the number 12 is because it is associated with the 12-year orbit of Jupiter, which therefore traverses the 12 houses of the zodiac, there is another more hidden or occult significance to the number 12, which goes into esoteric and lesser known aspects of the Kabbalah, where matter itself is said to resemble a cube, as 12 is a number of lines that border a cube, and is considered the maximum number of parts in a system. The cube corresponds to the physical realm and material world, and its blackness is symbolic of the mother goddess, as even light is first born from the darkness. Twelve represents the borders or supports of the world, and all of reality. All of physical reality is constrained and restrained by the 12 lines that mark the edges of the physical world. And 13 is the number that bonds multiplicity back into oneness, and is also associated with the lunar cycle and the sacred or secret goddess religion. Incidentally, Kubaba is the name of the only queen on the Sumerian kings list, which states that she reigned for a hundred years and in later times she was worshipped as a mother earth goddess in the same role as Phrygian, Greek, Roman, and mother Sibeli, who has been connected to Freya. Math was and is an important part of all esoteric philosophies. As Pythagoras famously said, all is number, and it's through a deeper understanding of the sacred geometry of the goddess cube and the occult rituals that mystery cults engaged in that allegedly opened the door to possibilities such as divination, which was banned in the Bible and punishable by death for the commoner, but continued underground throughout the centuries by a certain elite up until this day. My name is Robert Supper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts. So please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful Friday and I hope to see you again soon.